Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope you helped yourself to some breakfast and some coffee. It's going to be a long and busy day today. Um, on behalf of the BC Patient Safety Quality Council uh, and our partners at the uh, Specialist Services Committee and the Ministry of Health, I would like to welcome you to our Squan Day and we are delighted to have you join us. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is within the shared territories of the tsleil and Musqueam First Nations and it is Thank you. Musqui and Squamish. Okay. It is our pleasure to introduce Sequalia Ann Wanak, an Indigenous knowledge keeper with the Squamish Nation, to open our day in a good way. Thank you for letting me add the nations. Anhof and Squalwin, Quisclake, Quachnomi, Tenoyapen and Siayat, to Squiles, to Seats. I'm really glad to see you all came here today. And I was going to ask who brought the rain to Vancouver. No. <laughs> and um, Kai Ochten, welcome to the unceded Coast Salish territories of Skohotmish Okamayot, Squamish Nation, tsleil Sawasan, and Musqueam. And I'm Sequalia from Squamish Nation, and I've been with the team for about two, two years, nearly three years. So I'm really glad to be here today. And when um, she first opened, I thought she said it's Swan Day. <laughs> I need a hearing aid. And I thought, well, that's a nice, elegant thought to have for today and just flow gently in the water while you learn and share together. And it's really important because some of you I may have seen or you saw me at other events. And today I understand is about Nchomo being one today. And if I was able to put this in the middle of all of you and look at it, you would see it from all your different views. And that's what you're here today about, to hear different views, share comments and questions with each other, and be able to have all those different views and create solutions. Chen Chen Stwight, standing and working together to hold each other up, support one another, and as the old people, my old people, ancestors always said, you never stop le learning until the day you leave this earth. And that's what this is about, I understand, from reading what the goals are and knowing all the work that you do. And maybe it's a day to take care of yourself because you all take care of other people. Always remember to take care of yourselves and being able to go into work because when the work you do as doctors, always say a prayer to the Creator because you're the tools, your hands or whatever, your minds of the Creator to help and heal people. And by doing that, you know, I'm not a church person. My um, great granny's father was excommunicated by Bishop Drury and called our family pagans and heathens because we wouldn't give up our cultural ways and language. So I say I'm a pagan from Capilano, and, um, but I'm spiritual in our longhouse ways in life. So I believe in prayer like our ancestors did. Because everyone prays to a higher power. The higher power is known by many names in different cultures and languages. And I'm going to sing Sequalia Slolam Ha Squile, Sequalia's song. And it's a healing song. 
And I want you to stand with them in a second with your hands at your side. Because the old people say the creator and energy flows amongst us. And when you go like this in negotiating, what are you doing? Yeah, closing yourself off. Or you put your hands like this or this. Closing yourself off so when I'm singing and we say a prayer, just take a breath and say a prayer while I sing. Then I'll say the prayer. Then I'll turn it back over the team. And I, my hands are up to the team for organizing a great day and bringing you together. And to be able to pray for each other, because the old people say you don't pray for yourself because everyone's praying for you. And pray for all your family and friends. And now I'll ask you to rise. If I see you, you put your hands together and I do look around. I'll walk down and use you for my drum. Because <laughs> I want the energy flowing. And some people have told me when I, after I finish, they've come up to me and said, I could feel energy flowing. And so that's what it's about, helping each other. Asking the Creator to watch over and guide each and every one of your children gathered here today. Help each and every one of them with their swallowing, their feelings of their heart, their body, mind, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being. Help them with their words they're going to hear and take into their heart what's meant for them and let the rest be set aside for if they need it later and into their memory and the words they'll speak, the snatchum. 
and that they'll maybe write and then use for their tzetzot, the work that they do. Asking them, you creator, to watch over and guide all their families and their well-being. Chenquim and Tomi Kakakanak Manman, asking you, Creator, to help all of our family and friends who have serious illnesses, the many types of cancer and those going for treatment, many heart problems that people have in surgeries, the many types of arthritis that some people suffer with, the diabetes, HIV, AIDS meningitis and many other illnesses and those with going for serious injuries or surgery for their health, healing and recovery. Asking you, Creator, to help all of our family and friends who may be battling drugs and alcohol and those that are lost on that path and those incarcerated because of their addictions and prayers for their families who love them and don't want to lose them, asking them to find that healing path to recovery so that maybe they'll survive and share their story with others not to go down that dark path, asking prayers for all of those who may have lost loved ones and who have a heavy heart and sorrow to feel lightened in their spirit, to know the pain doesn't go away, it only gets easier so that one day you remember your loved one, not with grief and sorrow, only with the happiness of the memories you have in your heart and mind. And that they always worry about us left here on earth who have our daily journey in life to follow, worrying about living and all that we have to worry about during the day. And that they send you signs I read recently that dragonflies have two sets of wings because they carry angels on their back and that when they come around you, it's probably a loved one who's there to lift your spirit if you're dwelling on something. Or maybe a butterfly, hummingbird, eagle. One guy said a crow was um, knocking on his head and he said, Thank you for your words. I lost my mom last year, and she, when I was growing up, she always went like this when I needed to. She'd say, use your head and think. And he said, I was walking, dwelling, and worrying about something, and a crow flew down and hit me on the head. He said, after you talked, I realized it was my mom. So they send you signs and are always with you in spirit. So always know that, asking Creator that today's meeting, all the energy that everyone's in Chomot, one, in Chomot Shkwalawan, one heart and one mind today, Chen Chen Stwite, to stand and work together, to hold each other up, support one another. And for the meeting that you're sharing today, putting blessings on the food you already ate. I said a prayer before you all dished up. And a prayer on your lunch today at lunch. And praying, Creator, to bring everyone home safely tonight or tomorrow to their families because life is precious. You all take care and never speed around. Like one of my elders said, we're always in a hurry worrying about being late, but you don't want to be too early going to the ancestors. So take your time, especially in the rain and snow. Thank you. Those are my words. You can sit down now. <laughs>
So good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I want to thank, give great thanks to our knowledge keeper, Sequalia, for the territorial acknowledgement and warm and welcoming greeting this morning. I would say you filled us with energy, so thank you for Sequalia's song and your prayers, setting us off to a good start today. For those who I may not have already met, my name is Marilyn Copes. Uh, I'm a registered nurse, and I am currently the senior advisor with the Ministry of Health, uh, working on the Provincial Surgical Services Strategy. <clears throat> I have the extreme good fortune and pleasure to co-chair the Provincial Surgery Executive Committee with my partner in crime there, stand up, <laughs> Dr. Andy Hamilton. <clears throat> and I also co-chair Shared Care Committee, one of the committees between the Doctors of BC and the Ministry of Health. <clears throat> and my co-chair on that committee is Dr. Ken Hughes. We are fortunate in British Columbia to have an approved surgical services strategy, developed in large part by the Provincial Surgery Executive Committee back in 2014-2015. <clears throat> Equally important is that the strategy remained in place when the government of the day changed in 2017. We certainly want to acknowledge how hard everyone is working on implementing the components of the surgical services strategy. It's not an easy feat, uh, and you have to be in it for the long haul, uh, but I, I'm so pleased that so many people have committed to that. <clears throat> And in fact, we are seeing progress on implementing the strategy and in terms of improving wait times um, and improving the experience of care for the patients and their families. This is occurring through the partnerships and underlying relationships which are critical to us working together. In fact, over breakfast at that table this morning, Dr. Bell was commenting on how important it is to have everyone in the room together. So whether you're patient partners, physicians, nurses, allied health, doctors of BC, you name it, we've got a huge community of people that are working together to improve the care for patients across the province. And we have many of those members in the room with us today. So we have our patient partners, and I'm going to call out on Vicki as one partner, and Pamela, who I can see. So great to have you with us today, and I'm sure there are others. Physicians, healthcare team members, nurses, physiotherapists, administrators, health authority partners, <clears throat> doctors of BC, the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council, the Ministry of Health, Specialist Services Committee, Shared Care Committee, and many, many others who collectively can help us all be successful in improving surgical services in British Columbia. <clears throat> That's why a day like today is so important. It's going to set us off on the right track for the next couple of years, and that's why we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today and helping us figure out what are the next steps forward. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Marilyn, and welcome, everyone. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Colleen Kennedy. I'm the Executive Director of Health System Improvement and Engagement with the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. And we want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. We're absolutely thrilled that you're here. And as Marin alluded to, this is all about partnerships. It's all about relationships. And so as we, as we work together, this day wouldn't happen without these partnerships. And I wanted to honor everyone who's here today who's taken the time to come, because together we can actually start shifting and continue to make surgery better. The Surgical Quality Action Network, through days like today, is a thing that brings us all together. And the network is really meant to be a forum, forum to discuss best practice, to share local innovations, and to connect to improve surgical care in BC. So if you aren't already a member, shameless plug, um, you can actually sign up for a membership with the network. It's free um, at the desk. But as, as Mar uh, Marilyn mentioned today, again, we're all about relationships. And we really hope that today will give you an opportunity to grow your own network. 
We encourage you to connect with familiar faces and reach out to make sure you meet some new as well. It's through these relationships that we can continue to improve quality in BC. So today is all about learning, and it's learning um, and sharing diverse perspectives with your colleagues. It's about increasing knowledge um, around successful improvement initiatives and practical tools that you can take away to use when you go back to work this week. About uncovering and aligning the work we do together, and that's so vital, is how can we align the work to help accelerate improvements? Increasing our collective understanding of how we can leverage data, so how do we actually use that data to inform the improvements and support those improvements? So today we're really looking forward to hearing about Ontario's wait time experience and, and covering a wide range of topics and breakout sessions. From breaking down barriers and building bridges to applying change management, reducing variation, advancing pre-optimization, and much more. We hope you take something away today that inspires you to action. After lunch, we want to tap into your collective wisdom. We want to invite you to help us build SQUAN together in an interactive workshop. And in this session, you will really help inform surgical improvement in the province. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts. We are very excited to be advancing this work together. And even though we're from different organizations, different sites, and different perspectives, we have a common purpose of wanting the best outcomes for our patients. And speaking of patients, I want to acknowledge that today is a patients included event. And what that means is we've, we're committed to engaging patients in the planning, delivery, and participation of today's event. And this is a demonstration of our commitment to having patients inform and, and their patient experience inform where we're going. I would like to invite our patient partners to actually stand up, if you'd be so kind, if you're comfortable doing that. I really want to honor them and, and those in the room. If you're comfortable standing up, patient partners, we really want to thank you for your time today. Each of these members have come today on their own time. Each of them are here on their own time, volunteering their time, volunteering their experience to help inform where we're going. So thank you so much. As Marilyn mentioned, we have made so many advances in surgical quality in the province. But there's still so much opportunity to continue making it even better. And before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to challenge you. I wanted to challenge each of you to help us get there. It's in our hands. So what will you take away from today to help improve surgical quality? It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bob Bell. If I read all of Bob's bio, we actually wouldn't have any time at all for his talk this morning, and I don't want to lose his incredible wisdom. But Bob served as, as the Deputy Minister of Health and Long-Term Care from 2014 to 2018 in Ontario. Prior to this, he served nine years as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the University Health Network. He was previously the Chief Operating Officer at Princess Margaret Hospital and the Chair of both Cancer Care Ontario's Clinical Council and the Cancer Quality Council of Ontario. Dr. Bell is an orthopedic surgeon and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, the American College of Surgeons, and an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. We are utterly thrilled to have him join us today and share his learning from the Ontario Wait Time experience. So, uh, this cane, I just got my hip fixed. And uh, my orthopedic surgeon said, you can't fly out to BC. What are you talking about? And I said, well, I'm going to fly to BC for sure. And he said, you got to promise me you'll take a cane to walk up the stairs. So, there. Everybody can tell him that I did that, okay, if he checks with you. So thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Thank you for that kind introduction, Colleen. And it's a real pleasure to talk to a group that's got action in its name. Because when you're talking about surgery, if you're going to engage surgeons and the teams that look after surgical patients, it's got to be about action. And uh, I want to talk to you about the action that's occurred in Ontario, very much parallel to what you've been doing. Some things you're ahead on, for example, NISQIP BC started the whole NISQIP program. We've largely copied what you've done. Uh, other areas, perhaps we can offer something for, uh, for your consideration as to how you can serve your patients better. Um, I've only got one conflict of interest, nothing to do with the talk I'm about to give you, but when you're looking at your Christmas list, 
consider going on Amazon.ca looking for HIP novel. All right, the novel HIP. All proceeds from this go to surgical oncology research at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto. And this is actually a novel about surgical quality and surgical innovation and what happens when innovation goes terribly wrong. So HIP, the novel. Consider buying that to read and giving it out in hundreds over your Christmas lists. <laughs> the, uh, the issue of timing, the issue of wait times in quality is interesting, because if we look at Don Berwick and the work the IHI has done in talking about the domains of quality, of course, timeliness is impacted by the issue of wait times. But realistically, so many other dimensions of quality are, are, are also impacted by the time that our patients wait. Clearly, for some patients, especially cancer patients, it's possible that safety is involved in their wait time. Effectiveness, quite often delayed surgery, means the surgery can be less effective. I'm going to talk about efficiency in the process of waiting and the importance of money saving in dealing with wait lists in a more effective way. Equitability, so we know that one of the biggest features of our publicly funded system that we're so proud of, that people get care based on their need rather than their ability to pay so much is inequitable in wait times. There's certain people through influence, through social equity, get access to care faster than others. And finally, of course, what's more patient-centered than responding to patients' expectations? that they get access to care when they need it and they get access to the right care at the right time. So I think when we're talking about wait times, we're talking about the entire panoply of the various elements of, uh, of quality. You know, a lot of people say that Canadian wait times are terrible. In fact, there's a lawsuit that's about to be decided in this province related to private health care. It's going to be very interesting to see how Brian, Brian and I have known each other for years, of course, we're both orthopedic surgeons, how his lawsuit turns out. And I'll talk a little bit editorially about the impact of private funding on public wait times in this slide, which comes from Australia. And uh, it, it demonstrates that publicly funded wait times in Australia are actually quite a bit worse than publicly funded wait times in Canada. This is actually Australian data. They, they published this on the Australian literature. And the wait times in Australia for publicly funded patients have degraded progressively as more and more private funding has become available. Australia now is about 50% of its patients who have private insurance, have access to private hospitals, who pay for private consultations. And as that's occurred, of course, their wait times, privately paid patients are much better but publicly funded wait times have fallen off the map. So when we talk about private investment in improving wait times, as the Fraser Institute does in Canada, be wary and look at the international data related to the impact of private care on public wait times. If we look at other, this is the only country that has no private care. Sweden has about 10% of its patients with private insurance. And our wait times, public wait times, are about the same as Sweden's. When we look at the ones that are well recorded in the OECD database, um, Canada does not have any wait times in the OECD database because, of course, we don't collect wait times as a country. We collect wait times as various provinces, and we don't bring the data together. And indeed, we all collect that in different ways. So it's hard to get a context of what Canadian wait times are. If you want to see a comparison of various countries, go on the website. There's a website, drbobbell.com, which has an analysis of seven different countries and health systems. And one of the things we focus on is their wait times. We'll leave that, we'll leave that, uh, that URL with you. So if we look at Sweden, if we look at the national health system in England, where, again, about 10% of people have private insurance. Our wait times for some things are a little bit better, for some things a little bit worse. England, in particular, has uh, difficulty with its cancer wait times. 
it's very difficult to tell exactly how we compare with uh, British cancer wait times. Uh, but when you really dig down into, because they measure them differently, when you really dig down into them, Canadian wait times for cancer surgery are probably better, are definitely better than the NHS. And that's actually reflected, interestingly enough, in our cancer outcomes. If you look in recent reports, the Concord uh, database reports in Lancet, we've now had three sequential reports looking at cancer five-year survival in the three provinces in this country which have complete registration of cancer patients, that's BC, Manitoba, and Ontario, if we look at that data, we've actually got the best cancer outcomes in the world. In fact, we compete with Western Australia to be absolutely the best, but if you look at general broad cuts across many, many disease sites, certainly Canada, uh, privately funded patients in the United States, their registries don't include all patients. Australia and the Scandinavian countries in general are at the top of cancer survival lists. And the NHS, France, Germany are actually worse. To me, that's not a bad indicator for the overall quality of care in a health system. Because for cancer survival to be good, it means not only do you get access to cancer care in time-effective fashion, but also screening programs are picking up more patients at earlier stage of disease, that you have broadly effective screening programs that are equitable and stretch across the population. So, you know, when we talk about the Canadian health system and the concerns that perhaps the Canadian health care system is is suffering, and there's no question, I will come back to this, there are lots of things that we need to do to make it better. When we look at cancer care, it's probably a pretty good general indicator that our system is working effectively for serious illnesses, for serious illnesses. And I'll, I'll take you back again to this, uh, there's the URL. Uh, this website has done an analysis, international health system profiles, of seven different countries and uh, two different health systems, and has looked at issues like quality, has looked at issues like wait times, and has considered just how is the Canadian system shaping up without any real political you know, bent toward what the, uh, what the, uh, what the data shows us. Um, it's been particularly interesting in Ontario, one of the systems we look at is Kaiser Permanente. Everybody's heard of Kaiser Permanente, right? Everybody knows that Kaiser Permanente is the highest quality health system in the world, right? Gets great outcomes, right? Everybody agrees? Do you know that Kaiser Permanente stops insuring people when they turn 65? You know, it's a workplace insurance scheme, right? So some people keep their insurance past 65, they work to 67. But when you get into the Populations that require most care that we all know about have the most challenges in quality, seniors' populations. Kaiser Permanente is sort of, you know, good. Over to Medicare, you go there. Some retirees maintain their Kaiser Permanente insurance, but when you look at Kaiser Permanente and their quality, it, it, it's an interesting money-making machine. It's a not-for-profit that has $15 billion on its balance sheet and pays its CEO $7 million a year. So, interesting organization. Now, we looked at a number of different countries from the perspective of wait times, from the perspective of how we manage patients, and we looked at five lessons that developed for Ontario, and apologies, but most of these lessons are generalizable to most Canadian provinces. And the first lesson was we are extremely fortunate in that we've avoided having private insurance and private payment for medically necessary diseases in Canada. And that we need to fight like mad to keep that out of our system. Because when we look at the experience in places like New Zealand, in places like Australia, the entire publicly funded system starts to deteriorate once you introduce private pay. Even when you've got populations like in England that only have 10% of their patients insured privately. If you, I'm a cancer surgeon by background, an orthopedic oncologist, know the, uh, know the oncology systems fairly well in most countries. 
If you look at the Royal Marsden, for example, which is a public cancer hospital, probably the premier, most famous cancer hospital in England, Royal Marsden has devoted about 50% of its inpatient resources to private pay in order to improve its balance sheet, in order to improve its financial position. So, you know, you start to introduce these remarkable perturbations into our system when you start thinking about patients having different values. And that's especially true. That is different values attached to different patients. That's a private patient. That's a public patient. And to this point, we haven't had that problem in Canada. And uh, I think it's important that we try to avoid getting to that situation because it will make our publicly funded system much, much more um, costly. And perhaps if we have time at the end, we can come back to actually what would happen in Canada if the lawsuit in British Columbia is successful and is, you know, appealed and is uh, successful at its eventual appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. So the first principle that we thought looking at these countries was we need to keep private pay out of Canada. Second issue is we clearly need pharmacare, clearly, for a variety of reasons. First of all, for the 15% of Canadians who don't have access to drugs. Secondly, to make drugs more cost effective. We have to look at a different way of purchasing pharmaceuticals. When we talk about lessons, we talk about sustainability of our system, ensuring that our publicly funded system is affordable for taxpayers. The third issue was fixed wait times, and that's what I'm going to focus on after this slide, um, and the concept of fixing wait times, which is the biggest cocktail conversation about Canadian health care that occurs. You all know as representatives of our system, workers in our system, when you're at a Thanksgiving party or Christmas party, somebody's going to tell you a story about their aunt or themselves that have problems getting access and long wait times for our system. The fourth thing, and this is true in Ontario, I think it's also true in BC, is the integration of community care and the consumer approach to how we treat people in community care. This is the front door of our health system. This is where we need to respond to people in a consumer-like fashion and try and make their access to our system as effective and as easy as possible. And when it comes to primary care, when it comes to mental health and addictions in the community, when it comes to home care, those three big chunks of service that we provide in community, they tend not to be very customer friendly quite often, hard to get access, my phone call doesn't get returned, and they tend not to be integrated. Quite often, primary care providers don't know about access to adolescent mental health services. They don't necessarily know what's going on in the home care of their patients. So certainly, integration of care in the community is an enormously important step for us to focus on. And finally, this is something I didn't know until we started doing these reviews in various countries. We spend less on the social determinants of health in Canada than any other wealthy country. So if we look at the 10 wealthiest countries of the world, we spend the lowest proportion of our GDP on things like income security, food security, water security even. We are massive underspenders on the social determinants of health in this country, which is surprising to me, but something that really we need to think about. So. Let's go to wait times. Uh, not important that you see the data on these slides, but simply to show you, as you know, that you publish information on wait times. There's a publicly accessible wait times, um, wait times uh, access, wait times website for BC. And one good thing you do is you publish wait times by surgeons, not just by hospitals. Ontario still only aggregates data, data at the hospital level, although we gather it at the surgeon level. So patients like to know what their surgeon's wait time is. They don't want to know what the hospital wait time is. That doesn't mean much to them. Um, and this is something you do that's good. To my understanding, and I'll look to Dr. Hamilton here, you don't currently publish wait one data, I don't believe. You collect wait one data, it's accessible, Okay, well, uh, that'll undoubtedly come up in the discussion and the work of the day. But um, my sense is one thing I pushed for very, very hard when I was deputy 
was to make sure our weight one data was correct and that we were publishing it. And I'll, I'll give you the caveats to that. So um, here you can see a screenshot from the Ontario Weight One database. And we publish a number of different things that are accessible to patients and to the citizens and to administrators. There are problems with this data. It's accurate data, but it only counts for people referred for either surgery or for cardiac intervention or for imaging, diagnostic imaging, CT and MRI, who go through and get the procedure. So this whole time clock starts ticking when the patient's referred, but if the patient's referred for a total hip replacement to an orthopedic surgeon, and the orthopedic surgeon, she says, no, that's not appropriate, that patient's wait one time is not recorded. It only gets recorded if that patient goes through and actually has orthopedic surgery. And that's a problem. That is a problem. However, I'd say that with the wait times that we've established, those patients who are actually going ahead and getting surgery are actually being seen in reasonable amounts of time. And it's interesting the things that we gather data for, right? We gather data as you do for cataracts, we gather data for hips and knees, and these are the things that have been uh, these are the things that have been in the wait times gun site for some time for cardiac care. We gather that data. We're, not, we're now gathering in Ontario information for every, uh, every surgical weight, so general surgery, pediatric surgery. Everything is gathered from perspective of wait one if you're going through to surgery and the time from intention to treat to, uh, to surgery. So our target time, in this case, this is a total joint uh, wait time, wait one time, where the anticipation is that everybody should have seen their surgeon who they were referred to, and I'm gonna come back to that, who's the right person to be referred to, within six months. And as you can see, it's pretty consistent that 90% plus of people get access to a surgical opinion within six months time. That's weight one. And most of our times, cataracts, total joints, and, and our general surgery times are better than that. Our cancer times are, are very, very good. Um, those are weight one times. Uh, decision to treat to surgery, not as good. These are weight twos, of course. The surgeon books you for surgery. The time's then measured until you get access to care. And you can see that 81% of people if we look at priority four patients, so priority, this is for total joint surgery. The priority system is particularly important for cancer. Um, you know, there are different, uh, different uh, times appropriate for people to get access to surgery. If you've got a brain tumor, it needs to be within a day or two sometimes. So we have one, two, three, four. For total hip replacements, it's, it's uh, a P4 case. It's a priority four. And the anticipation is that you should have access within, um, I believe it's 182, yeah, 182 days. Uh, the average, the weight, weight on average is 112 days and 84% of people get access within the six month time period. Um, critics will say that that means that everybody's waiting for a year because your wait one time is six months, your wait two time is six months. But of course, these are 90 percentile times, right? So that's not in any way the average experience that people have. It's probably more accurate to get the average experience by adding together the average weight one time, the average weight two time. And I can tell you, as somebody who just had a hip replacement, um, you know, I waited for about four months, and, and that was the time my surgeon gave me, and that was appropriate for my life, right? By the time I sort of got everything rearranged and thought about where I was going, what I was doing, it didn't seem like, uh, you know, I was a little more sore at the end of four months than I was when I started, and I was probably worse than most people <laughs> getting a hip. I probably delayed it longer than most because surgeons always wait longer, right, before they address things that are actually wrong in their specialty. So uh, I can tell you, waiting four months for total hip replacement is not like a horrible thing. We have our hospitals listed, and there you see times it takes to, in this case, get a hip replacement an average time. Uh, William Osler Health System, which is a massive uh, provider of, uh, of musculoskeletal care, 
Uh, average wait's only uh, 24, 24 days. It's been anomalous, but it's true. Um, and I'm going to come to why some hospitals are long outliers. Part of the reason that Osler is good is was one of the early adopters of what I'm going to show you, which is wait list management. Our uh, results, again, stable over time, haven't changed very much. When we drop more money into the system, we can definitely see times improve. Especially, that's especially true with diagnostic imaging. You know, if you decide that you're going to do a few more MRIs this year and put more money into the system, the wait time tends to respond. Now, here's, the, here's really the significance of the talk. And when you talk about queuing theory, it's a little intimidating. People start thinking about, um, you know, calculus, and they start thinking about first and second and third differentials and integrals under the curve and stuff like that. But I'm going to introduce you to the queuing theory of wait times for surgery, which is so simple. This deals with the political context, and it deals with the cocktail context. Because obviously, the thing that determines how politicians respond to wait times, and the thing that impacts you at your Thanksgiving dinner table or your Christmas cocktail party, is the amount of time that people are waiting, and the number of people that are waiting for service. So that volume under the curve, that issue of how many people are waiting, how long are they waiting, and crucially, what are they waiting for, is what gives you as a quality action network the opportunity to start slicing and dicing your data and start looking at how you can improve wait times without costing a lot of money. So. When we actually looked at Ontario wait one times for all services, what we saw was more than 50% of people were waiting for musculoskeletal opinions. You know, this were, these were people who were waiting to see orthopedic surgeons. And what were they waiting for? They were waiting, these are the conditions they were waiting for. They were waiting for number one back pain, number two neck pain, number three hip pain, number four knee, number five shoulder. Um, and this comprised 50% of the wait times. They weren't waiting to be seen for their hernia. Hernia consultations were being done very quickly. This comprised, when we look at volumes of patients, amount of time they were waiting, this was well over 50% of the wait time experience in Ontario. And what were they waiting for? They were waiting to see surgeons. And the next thing to ask yourself when you're looking at your wait time data is what are people waiting for? Because what you're going to find quite often is they're waiting to see the wrong person. So when we looked at musculoskeletal in particular, what we were seeing was a huge number of people waiting to see a surgeon. The typical story I would hear as a hospital CEO is this. So they would say, you know, I've had back pain for a while, so I saw my family doctor, he gave me a little physio, da 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 started me in anti-inflammatories, then told me I wasn't getting better, I needed an MRI, I waited for six months for an MRI, I saw my MRI, and I had three levels of degenerative disc disease in my lumbar spine, it's a miracle I'm even walking. Oh, everybody in this room's probably got three <laughs> levels of degenerative disc disease on their MRI. Part of the problem with MRI is it gives you exquisite detail of degenerative anatomy in your lumbar spine, which doesn't need surgery at all. But they would then say, okay, the GP then said, three levels of degenerative disc disease, you gotta see a neurosurgeon. So then I waited for seven months to see a neurosurgeon. So now I'm seven months in, my stomach's sore from the non -steroidals. I'm starting to use opioids, big issue, starting to use opioids. And I get to see the neurosurgeon spine specialist who spends 20 minutes with me and says, you don't need surgery. So after a year of waiting for various things, I'm back at where I started from. So clearly, a lot of our wait times are organized around waiting for the wrong person to see you. And we stole shamelessly from Saskatchewan, and they stole shamelessly from Scandinavia. And starting a program called we call Isaac, Interprofessional Spine Assessment Education Clinics, where you wait for no more than two or three weeks to see the right person. That is, you wait to see either a general practitioner specially uh, trained in spine care, or you see a chiropractor, or you see a physiotherapist, somebody who knows how to assess 
spine symptoms. Why do we choose spine? Well, you know, if you look at societal burden, I mean, it's enormous, right? You got about 25% of people uh, who are responsible for 75% of the cost of disability. If you look at the primary cause of disability in, uh, in insurance in Canada, the number one cause is mood disorders. Right behind that is back and neck pain, people who are disabled because of back and neck pain. Maybe small, uh, getting a little bit smaller since we become more of a service economy than we are a uh, manufacturing economy, but still huge. So it's a huge problem. There's also enormous turf associated with looking after back pain. Physiotherapists, chiropractors, surgeons, a variety of different people. So one of the things that we did top down in Ontario was to say, look, you got to work together on this. This is a real problem. People are dissatisfied with the care we're providing. People are waiting too long for the wrong service. So we got these various groups of people to agree that we would do what is crucial, and that is to move upstream. This is an upstream model of care where you see people within a couple of weeks of referral. Generally speaking, people have about six weeks. You don't want to see somebody when they first get back pain. A lot of people get back pain. It's gone within a couple of weeks. You want to see people who have six weeks back pain. You don't want to see people who are more than a year. At that point, they're, they're chronically impaired, and our program isn't going to help. But this program is designed to do a couple of things. The first thing to do is to diagnose you and to look at the various aspects of you holistically that build into your back pain experience. So questionnaires are crucially important to look at your tendency to be dependent on opioids. And about 20% of people with back pain are highly dependent on opioids. And when you look, I mean, nobody needs to talk to this audience about opioid addictions and the horrors that result from it. But a huge number of people's opioid journey starts with having back pain and prescription of opioids for back pain. Chronic, chronicity of disease, your tendency to be chronically ill. That questionnaire is extremely important here, as well as documenting the uh, degree of disability that you have from your back pain. Now, after going through the screen by a both physical examination, these various questionnaires, history, about maybe 10 to 15 percent of people are thought to be appropriate for a surgeon to see. Only that proportion of people. And the crucial thing about Isaac is it offers self-management care as well. So you go into a class and you have a series of up to six classes, three to six classes, where people talk to you about what back pain is, the fact that those three levels of degenerative disc disease you got in your MRI are the same as everybody else has. And they talk to you about how you manage this, the exercises you need to do, the lifestyle you need to adopt to manage your back pain. And probably the key, let me see if I can find something to point with. Is there a, yeah. This is the, uh, the key outcome here. The amount of uh, low chronicity after six months of actually being in the Isaac program. People still have back pain, but they're not afraid of it now. They can manage it now. They're going to work with it now. They know what to do with it. And for so many of the chronic diseases that we managed, taking it out of the surgical screen and putting it into a self-management screen is crucial. We've extended that to a variety of different musculoskeletal conditions. As mentioned earlier, about 50% of people are, are being referred to surgeons for musculoskeletal complaints. And you know, if you ask the, the usual family doctor, how do you assess uh, somebody with shoulder pain? You know, it's complex, and they don't have a lot of confidence in it. And when they're not sure why their patient isn't getting better, with some shoulder physiotherapy, the tendency is to refer them to a shoulder surgeon. And again, probably only about 10 or 15% of people are gonna need shoulder surgery. So the concept of rapid access centers, where you get referred within two to three weeks to see somebody who's not a surgeon but has expertise, has dramatically improved the experience as this program gets started. Um, in the Champlain-Lynn, the Ottawa area, 
wait times were reduced by about 40 percent without any investment of operating time whatsoever, simply by organizing the triage of people with hip and knee complaints, having them seen not by a surgeon but by a physiotherapist or a primary care doc with training in hip and knee disorders, and then, if they agreed, referring them, if they did need surgery, to the shortest waiting list. <laughs> it sounds so simple, but it's so important to manage wait lists in that if we're running our surgical referral system in the usual way that we do it, like a mom and pop office where everybody keeps their own wait list, you're going to have some people with two-year wait lists. And guess what? They're usually the most senior, well-known, most popular surgeons. So they keep on getting the referrals. The doctors with two-month wait lists don't get as many referrals. And the general attitude, the general opinion of the population is, well, you got to wait two years for a total hip because that guy's got a two-year waiting list. And of course, it's simply not true. So a dramatic change in wait experience by managing wait lists and also by managing access to surgery by ensuring that all surgery being provided across a fairly large number of hospitals around Ottawa was only provided if you were coming in through this common wait list methodology. Now, this upstream management is extraordinarily cost effective because it eliminates so many things that you don't need to do. The best example of that, perhaps, is the use of MRIs and x-rays for people who don't need x-rays in many cases and certainly don't need MRIs. So in my count, probably up to well, at least 40 percent, probably higher, of the MRIs done in Ontario are done for musculoskeletal conditions that don't need to be done. You do not need an MRI to determine that somebody needs a total joint replacement, either of their hip or their knee. And yet about 60 percent of people having joint replacements in Ontario have an MRI. So if you take that money and you put it into appropriate care with arthroplasty rather than investigation, you can reduce wait times and you can actually transfer money to a more appropriate utilization. The other thing that's present that we discovered in, in, um, in waiting for joint replacement surgery was many people would undergo an arthroscopy of their knee especially. They'd have an arthroscopy to see if they could get along without a joint replacement. And of course, that has no impact whatsoever on the likelihood that you're going to need a joint replacement. It has no impact on your symptoms. So moving from arthroscopy for degenerative arthritis to putting that money in the operating room into joint replacements also is one of the ways that you save money by moving your wait times management upstream and looking at the various things that people are waiting for. One of the things that you need to have to make this system work is if people don't need surgery, you need to have an alternate form of self-management physiotherapy or some form of self-management approach for them. This is something Ontario has not done yet and it needs to do. It's done it in spine, but it hasn't done it in hip and knee. The, the so-called GLAD program, for example, for knee arthritis patients who don't yet need total knee replacement is very effective, but not yet invested in. Um, so, you know, I think that we can tell you that attention to what people are waiting for can reduce musculoskeletal uh, weights dramatically, and by doing that, you're actually responding to about 50 percent of that total wait time volume. Other procedures, perhaps, if you look at the surgical procedures in Ontario, don't need this kind of wait one attention. If you look at our cancer surgery, certainly the cancer surgery, people are getting access both wait one and wait two within reasonable periods of time. But you only know what we currently know, and what we currently know is only that proportion of patients who are being referred for surgery who go to surgery. And that's a small part of the wait time issue that we're facing. So we think that the address, addressing the current wait time issue with the wait time problems that we currently have largely relates to moving upstream and putting in place better wait list queuing processes and ensuring that people are waiting for the right service. But 
Do I know how long people are waiting to see a neurologist or someone else about headaches or seeing a gynecologist or seeing any other specialist for a non-surgical issue in Ontario? No, I don't. And the only way we're actually going to get this kind of data um, is not by doing questionnaires. You know, questionnaires fly around from the Fraser Institute and asking people their opinion on how long people are waiting. Uh, what we need to do is we need to have e-referral. And e-referral, which actually launches from the EMR, so the primary care docs don't need to go into another system to make a referral with all potential sources for that referral on the other end of the system is absolutely crucial for us to manage wait times in a rational way, for us to understand how many people are waiting to see someone. I got, I've got my own bias. I think that headaches, people wait too long. I think that benign hematology, people wait too long. I think that benign gynecology, people wait too long. But I don't have any data to demonstrate that. That's purely cocktail conversation kind of thing and understanding what I hear from my colleagues. We need that information in order to organize our system better. And also to save money, I'm quite sure, by putting in place a system where we look at what people are waiting for and see if they're waiting for the right thing. So e-referral is essential, and there are a couple of programs that are starting to roll out across Ontario. Um, and, you know, it's uh, primary care docs, the ones really pushing this, especially since it launches from their EMR. The other thing that's been very useful in addressing wait times in Ontario is e-consult. Um, where the GP can actually, the primary care doc can actually ask a specialist a question and get a response within a few days in terms of the data currently available as to whether the consultant needs to see that patient and what steps the primary care doc can take in investigation and management. So, you know, when people talk about the Canadian healthcare system, you know, this is the perspective that too many people have, right? People are dying in our waiting rooms. They're dying waiting to see someone for just far too long. And in point of fact, people are right. We don't know whether people are waiting too long for many, many things. The stuff we're measuring, we're probably doing okay with, especially if we're able to work with the programs like I just mentioned for musculoskeletal. But we simply need to get the data, and this is cost-effective investment, to tell us how people are doing in general. So. This cuts across so many different aspects of surgical quality. It's so amenable to surgical quality action. This is stuff that you can do something about. Thanks for the opportunity to come here and talk to you about the Ontario experience. Amazon.ca. <laughs> it's in a great cause, surgical oncology research. Hip, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. The back of the room over here. Thank you, Dr. Bell, for a, a really um, inspiring presentation uh, on your experience in Ontario. Um, I'm a plastic surgeon at Children's Hospital, and I, I operations had at the hospital. Um, you've done a really eloquent job of, of describing um, the W1 side. And, you know, of course, as we all know, uh, those of us who al help allocate resources, there's a demand side and a supply side. And, um, and certainly on the W1 side, I could not agree more um, with appropriateness, which is what you're really focused on with respect to a surgeon seeing the appropriate patient for surgery. And that's, that's beautiful. I think we can implement that. The problem with this, though, is that it does nothing on the W-2 side. And if you just bear with me for a second, I'll explain to you why. In fact, you could make an argument that it makes the W-2 longer. If I've got 15 or 20 new patients in my clinic, and I'm seeing roughly about 50% of them are gonna be surgical patients in plastic surgery. A lot of them are not candidates. So in fact, if I'm seeing now 15 new patients that are all going to be surgical candidates, and, and it's been you know, streamlined and we've got a, a clinic ahead of time that's going to um, make sure that the appropriate patient comes to my clinic. In fact, the W2 is gonna get longer because the surgical patients that I see in my clinic are gonna end up on a surgical wait list. 
And you know, we've just we've just got a, a paper accepted with my colleagues from the Sauter School of Business. Um, and the interesting dynamic there is is that there's no cure for increased uh, there's no cure for a lengthy wait list other than increased capacity. Yeah. You may get two or three percent on efficiency, and I, I'll agree with that. Starting on time, finishing on time, et cetera. But if you don't have enough capacity, your W2 isn't gonna isn't gonna move. Yeah, thank you. I had the uh, same conversation this morning with your colleague in urology from the Boston Children's Hospital, Boston, uh, the Vancouver Children's Hospital. And you know, you are dealing in a you're dealing with a pretty you know finite set of resources and a finite need. I know the great work you do, and there's no question that. Once you know that you've got all the sources of opportunity squeezed out of the system, you need to put in more operating room time. But operating room time is so cheap, realistically. If you look at the various things we spend money on, so when I was, when I was deputy, I was looking at increasing the number of hips and knees by 20% by converting all the unnecessary MRIs and CTs. Now, that doesn't work in you, your system, I agree. But, you know, the cost of operating room time compared to everything else we do in the healthcare system and the impact it has, so the effectiveness per unit dollar invested is so enormous. And when I, when I was, you know, listen, I was a surgeon talking to the cabinet talking about putting increased investments in OR time, what I was saying was, I can guarantee you that every dollar that's being spent here, had, you know, the inefficiency and the waste, as you described, has been stripped out. And that the only people that are actually getting access to this are people that need to get access to it. And we're looking at upstream sources of quote unquote waste, unnecessary treatment. So I think people respond to the need for increased investment, in my experience, if you're able to talk about the full experience, because of course, bureaucrats, administrators, politicians are used to surgical people saying, we need more surgery, right? We do need more surgery, there's no question, that's part of the equation here. But by presenting a holistic view of what happens from the time the patient sees their primary care doc with a complaint, to the curative care that you're gonna provide, I've just found that's an easier sell for folks. Bob, uh, Jack Oliver from Kelowna. Hi, Jack. Nice to see you. Um, we've uh, got a 10-man group of orthopedic surgeons that have yeah. come together in the last two years, and now we're collecting weight one data. Uh, our data is collected by us, our clinic, yeah. our weight one, and then we're sharing that with our health authority, and we're also getting some uptake on our weight two times. Yeah. What my group, the younger guys, say, well, this is costing us to, to get this weight one data. It's costing us, yeah. the surgeons. Yeah. So I was wondering what happens in Ontario. Is, is this being handled by the actual surgical groups, or is it being handled by the health authority, or how is the yeah. cost of data retrieval? Yeah, so the wait time systems were put in a long time ago, Jack. They were put in in 2002. Um, and they were probably covering the vast majority of surgery. A colleague of mine, Alan Hudson, basically said to hospitals, if you don't tell your surgeons they got to do this, we're not going to give you any incremental funding at all, right? So there was a carrot and a stick here, both. Um, and still in Ontario, uh, the offices have to put in the information. But that information is gathered in a standardized fashion and putting it in in the hospital weight system, the OR booking system. You know, you just book a case online, essentially. And at that point, when you're booking it, that's the decision to treat. The time the surgery gets done is out of the dad. The only thing that's extra is when did you receive the referral? So it's not terribly onerous. Some people will complain about it, but it sounds like you're doing much more than that. In the early days of wait times in Ontario, to demonstrate how bad our wait times are, we started this off in surgical oncology in my hospital. We all used to keep cards on each one of our patients just to demonstrate to the government that cancer wait times in particular were becoming far too long. So this needs to be a systematic approach. You're absolutely right. Hi. Hi, Dr. Bell. Um, I'm Nancy, and I'm the Regional Practice Lead for Physiotherapy for Vancouver Coastal Health. So I just wanted to thank you for highlighting the need uh, for the GLAD program. 
uh, to help upstream people with osteoarthritis. We did have it in place for about a year did you? at Lionsgate and at um, Richmond Hospital. Publicly funded or with? Publicly uh, funded. Yeah, yeah. And then last year when they increased the number of surgeries, then they were told to pull back <laughs> and do the assessment. So uh, thank you for highlighting that. So was it as effective as the literature would suggest? I, I haven't seen my own eyes. I'm just out of the arthroplasty game now. So our team was um, pleasantly surprised at the responses um, by the uh, participants, yeah. saying that their pain decreased and they were able to do everyday activities. Yeah. And w I think one lady was really happy that she could get down on the floor and play with her grandchildren that she yeah, couldn't yeah. do before. So their confidence to move increased as well yeah. as their strength. Um, yeah, yes, based on your quadriceps muscle, right? I mean, your yeah. quadriceps muscle deteriorates and you're going to fall and you're going to not do... Anyway. So we, hopefully uh, we can try and um, that's great. encourage it. The other thing I wanted to mention that we, in Vancouver General Hospital, we have four physiotherapists that are doing advanced practice uh, assessing for back pain and they've yes. been really, really successful. Oh, well, that's great because, um, you know, I know how good your Vancouver General Spine Surgeons are, and yet I've also heard them say that they just see a lot of people they don't need to see. Yeah. And then we have our OASIS program. It also has physiotherapists and OTs uh, assessing people from primary care for GPs, assess, yeah. uh, referring them for assessment, and then the physio streaming them to is that Is that now a provincial program or just at your hospital? Uh, it's Vancouver Coastal Health, so Richmond, uh, Vancouver, and uh, Lionsgate. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you for the... Oh, please. Yeah. Hi, Bob. Thank you. Great uh, talk. I'm an orthopedic thank surgeon you. as well. Ah, um, one of the things I found very interesting that you talked about was the transfer of funding... Uh, by yeah. demonstrating an, an improved efficiency in something you're changing, like not having your patients do MRIs and then yeah. transferring that funding. I find that to be an extremely difficult problem in my health authority and probably most of them. When you do something like that, the money, like nobody knows where the money goes. Yeah, I know. Like when you save, when you, I'll give you a perfect example. You decrease your length of stay by half for a procedure that you do. You're not saving money. It's cost avoidance, but sure. you're you're doing it more efficiently. That money never gets put back in that program. It gets used so, for other things. So how did you? I'm going to ask how, if you did it. How did you do it? Yeah, because I think that's one of the keys. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because the data is all there. If you look at Choosing Wisely Canada, as you know, orthopedic surgeons and the Ontario or the Canadian Orthopedic Association and the Ontario Orthopedic Association have said arthroscopy for degenerative arthritis, we should stop doing that. We should stop doing MRI and CT or MRI for degenerative arthritis and unless the patient's going to surgery for back problems, right? So the data is there. In fact, the radiologists even said the same thing. But you're right. How do you actually say there's a large chunk of money that's inappropriately being spent and used? So there's got to be a connection. And the thing that I'm impressed with uh, your group is uh, the doctors at BC are engaged in this process, right? Because what Ontario is doing to try and accomplish this is linking together the discussions that occur between the physicians and the ministry around appropriateness um, with transferring these dollars. So the best example I can give you is the P4... MSK MRIs saying that money is going to come out. Um, we're going to reduce physician billings by that amount, but crucially, we've also got to reduce the operational funding that goes to hospitals. That's the only way that can actually happen, right? Otherwise, the MRIs will get used for something else. So the only way that you can actually do this is if you've got sort of a top-down and bottom-up approach. Bottom-up saying, Here's stuff we can do for appropriate shifting of money. And the crucial thing here is that physicians respond to appropriateness if it's a matter of shifting money. They don't respond very well at all, nor should they, if it's a matter of saving money. So the idea here is not to stop doing MRIs that aren't necessary to reduce the budget deficit. The idea is to put it into other much-needed parts of the system. So that's the kind of conversation that has to happen. 
But it has to happen at a level that involves the medical association, too. And, you know, you've got BC doctors here, doctors of BC here. So that's an important part of the conversation. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Bob, you. for your speech oh, and your pleasure. presentation. I have no doubt that your insights are going to carry through throughout the day today um, as we have our conversations about the actions we're going to take in BC and the, the action groups we're actually going to get going on this afternoon for SQUAN. Um, I'd also like to find it, present you with a, a little token of our appreciation, Bob. Thank you very much. Just a little piece of beef. Thank, Thank you. you. Now I can go up here. So I'm what stands between you and your coffee break, so I'll be quick. I have a couple of uh, housekeeping items for you. The first is, you may have noticed our fabulous red vests. Anyone that you see in a red vest, it's not because we forgot to check ahead and see what everyone was wearing. Um, these are actually the people you can go to today if you have questions on which room things are in, where's the washroom, what, you know, where's my uh, dietary needs for lunch, anything like that that 